deeper over the real truth. Why does a working class lad like you join the Tories? That's a good question. Don't miss it. Monday to Thursdays at noon on GB News. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. And welcome to The Briefing. I'm Arlene Foster and over the next hour we'll look back at the impact this last week has had on our Prime Minister's popularity. Plus we'll catch up with the latest Covid restriction announcements in Scotland and Wales and we'll look at the economic impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol. But first, it's the news with Olivia Guthrie. Good afternoon, and this is your news at three o'clock. Sir Keir Starmer says the Prime Minister is not fit for office and trust it is at an all-time low. He made the comments while meeting residents in Hadston in Northumberland. It follows an investigation into the refurbishment of his flat and three alleged Christmas parties during lockdown last December. Downing Street has announced it's cancelled this year's event. It's absolutely important that we get the bottom of this. This is just the latest allegation of dishonesty from the Prime Minister. We've had lie upon lie in relation to the parties going on in Downing Street. The Prime Minister is not fit for office. An increasing number of MPs say they'll vote against the new Covid rules next week. That's as Plan B is enforced across England in a bid to slow the spread of the Omicron variant. Masks should now be worn in most indoor settings, including cinemas and theatres, but they're not required in hospitality settings like pubs. The measures come ahead of a return to working from home on Monday and mandatory Covid passports for large venues from Wednesday. Conservative MP Craig McKinley told GB News he can't support the government. It's rather bizarre that the government's saying, well, you know, we want to take some liberties away, but it's, it's for your own liberty in the future. I don't like the sound of that. I'm not yet convinced. I don't want to go down the path of vaccine passports and mandation. I want a bit more data so that we can make the proper decisions at the right time, because this is going to cost jobs, lives, uh, and mental health and livelihoods. Household contacts of positive COVID cases in Scotland will have to self-isolate for 10 days, regardless of whether they test negative for the virus. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon says she can't rule out further restrictions as the result of the Omicron variant. She warned the country may need to brace itself for a new wave of infections. The fact is that we do face a renewed and a very severe challenge in the face of the new Omicron variant. Uh, to be blunt, 
because of the much greater and faster transmissibility of this new variant, we may be facing, indeed, we may be starting to experience a potential tsunami of infections. In Wales, First Minister Mark Drakeford's urging people to take lateral flow tests every time they leave the house. He says everyone aged 18 and over will be offered their third jab by the end of January. He also extended the guidance on face coverings to pubs and restaurants, as well as most indoor settings. We strongly urge everyone to flow before you go. That means taking a lateral flow test before you go out. Whether that's to a Christmas party, Christmas shopping, visiting friends or family, going to any crowded or busy place and before travelling. The Met Police has denied institutional homophobia after an inquest found police mistakes probably contributed to the deaths of serial killer Stephen Port's victims. Officers in Barking East London missed repeated opportunities to catch Port as he drugged, raped and murdered four young gay men. Port is serving a whole life sentence after being convicted in 2016. Well, there were certainly errors in the investigation. There's no doubt about that, and we're truly sorry for them. The coroner has directed the jury that they may not find um, that homophobia played a part, and that's because the evidence in the inquest has not justified that finding. And I agree with that. I don't think the Met is an institutionally homophobic organisation. Um, I do think that there were errors that were made, and I do think that we need to rebuild the trust of LGBT plus communities and people in London. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is a step closer to being extradited from the UK following a win by the US government in the High Court. Judges overturned a previous ruling that he shouldn't be sent to the US because of a suicide risk. He's wanted on allegations of a conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defence information after hundreds of thousands of leaked documents on the Afghan and Iraq wars were published. His fiancée, Stella Morris, says they'll appeal the decision. Every generation has an epic fight to fight, and this is ours, because Julian represents the fundamentals of what it means to live in a free society, of what it means to have press freedom, of what it means for journalists to do their jobs without being afraid of spending the left, rest of their lives in prison. I urge everyone to come together and fight for Julian. Julian represents all our liberties and all our rights. I'll be back with the latest headlines in half an hour. Now let's return to the briefing with Arlene. Hello and welcome to The Briefing, your afternoon fix of all the latest political news, debate and analysis. I'm Arlene Foster and here's what's coming up over the next hour. A poll released today puts the Labour Party four points ahead of the Conservative Party. We'll break down all of the reasons why the Prime Minister is under fire this week. Thus, we'll cross live uh, to Austria, uh, talking about the population coming out of a national lockdown on Sunday. However, the unvaccinated will still have to follow restrictions. And we'll be looking at the economic impact of the Northern Ireland Protocol with Professor Graeme Gudgeon. So give me your political briefing, send in your views and opinions by emailing gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. Well, what a week it's been for Boris Johnson. On Monday, we saw him in police gear as he observed a drugs raid in Liverpool. This was to promote the government's new strategy aimed at cracking down on crime related to drug gangs. And it was supposed to be the start of Crime Week. However, by Tuesday, nobody was talking about this as ITV News released the leaked video showing Downing Street aides joking about holding a Christmas party at number 10 in December last year. On Wednesday, Boris Johnson apologised about the contents of this video at Prime Minister's questions and insisted that he had been assured no COVID rules had been broken. However, Allegra Stratton resigned over uh, a few hours later and in the evening the Prime Minister then hosted a coronavirus briefing where he announced that we were moving to Plan B. 
This means working from home, mask wearing in shops and vaccine passports for nightclubs and large venues in England. This last measure has prompted more than 50 Tory backbenchers to publicly say they won't be supporting Plan B when it goes to a vote next week, leaving the government to rely on the opposition to get their proposals through. Also yesterday, the Conservative Party was fined by the Electoral Commission for failing to accurately report a donation that paid for the Downing Street flat refurbishment. However, in some more upbeat news, the Prime Minister's wife, Carrie Johnson, gave birth to a baby daughter. And in not so good news, a YouGov poll for The Times released today puts the Labour Party four points ahead of the Tories. That's quite a lot to take in. So what impact have the events of this week had on the Prime Minister's popularity? And joining me now is Joe Twynham, founder of Delta Poll. Joe, it's been quite a week. I can't, rem a week. <laughs> I can't remember a week uh, like it for quite some time. So what impact has this had on the Prime Minister's standing and indeed on the government's standing? Well, in terms of the short-term impact, it's been substantial. And we've seen the poll from, uh, from YouGov uh, yesterday and another poll earlier in the week uh, that showed that L the Labour Party have moved ahead, beyond the margin of error now, ahead, yeah. of, the, uh, ahead of the Conservatives. And this is an acceleration of the trend that we've seen over, uh, over recent weeks as this series of events, whether it's Owen Paterson, whether it's uh, Wallpaper Gate, uh, whether it's Barnard Castle, as these series of events have, uh, have continued. But the key question is what long-term impact yeah. will it have? Many of your viewers will be saying, well, does this actually matter? Well, this individual event probably doesn't. The question of Downing, uh, Downing Street Party is not the kind of thing that's going to sway someone one way or the other. But the cumulative effect of all these things that we've talked about could start forming a narrative in the minds of many voters that the Conservatives cannot be trusted, they don't act fairly, and they don't act in an equal way. One won't rule for them, one will rule for others. But then in the, if you like, short to medium term, it could also have an impact in terms of how people approach the new rules that are coming yeah. into place. A large proportion of people, nearly three quarters of people, support the new rules in principle. But whether they actually behave and follow them could now be brought into question by the Prime Minister's behaviour, but also it gives MPs on the back benches of the Conservative Party an opportunity to rebel as well, because they're upset at the situation. So it's made things very, very messy, but at least he's had another child. <laughs> Absolutely, and of course, uh, we wish him well with all of that, and Carrie as well. I, I mean, you talk about Barnard Castle, of course, that was the first big issue uh, for this government, if you may uh, think back to that time uh, when Dominic Cummings went uh, to Durham. Um, did that have an impact on the polls at that particular point in time? And how long did it take for the Conservatives to come back into place if it did have an impact? Uh, well, it did have a short term impact, yeah. definitely. But let's play a game and imagine it hadn't happened. Yeah. Could you see the polls being significantly different from where they are now? Mm. Probably not. They'd probably yeah. be around the same place. What happened was the vaccine programme started and, uh, and everything else around and COVID really uh, captured the public imagination in a bad way, of course. Yeah. And that really dominated the way that people were thinking about things. And so individual events like that, yes, they had a short term effect, but not a long term one. So you're saying to me, really, it's the fact that all of these other events have happened quite quickly together, starting with uh, Owen Patterson, if I can put it like that, and then moving on to Wallpaper Gate coming back again, uh, then the parties uh, in Downing Street, it all seems to be coming together. That is what's happening in terms of the polls at the moment, because this is the first time we've seen, as you've said, beyond the margin of error, really, isn't it? As opposed to what I'm interested in are the long-term yeah. trends. And what drives the long-term trends are these turning points rather than talking points. Mm -hmm. And each one of these individual things is an interesting talking point. Yeah. But it's the cumulative effect of all of them, Barnard Castle included, that helps inform the way that we think about parties and leaders. And the stories that we tell ourselves and each other about those parties informs how we vote. And certainly those stories have been very negative and in quick succession over recent weeks. And I'm going to use a phrase now that I hate, but I, I, other people are using it, so that's why I'm going to use it. You're saying really it has cut through to voters that ordinarily might say, oh, that's a Westminster story, we're not going to bother about that. This is actually cutting through. And I suppose an indication of that has been the fact that Ant and Deck are talking about it on their programme and it's now become a bit of a laugh. And no 
government official wants to be a bit of a laugh. Not uh, even Boris. Uh, not, even, not even Boris all the time. Yeah. Uh, you can define cut through in many different ways, but certainly I think for this particular story, it's clear that it's resonated beyond the usual suspects, beyond the Westminster bubble, and quote unquote, the average person and the 50% of people less engaged than the average person in the street yeah. are listening and hearing about this story in perhaps they, a way they wouldn't around something like Wallpaper Gate, for instance. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it really does seem to have resonated. Now, that doesn't mean that the effects will last, but it does seem to have resonated, at least for now. Yeah, and I want to talk to you about that because, uh, of course, in politics, it's all about events. And um, there are quite some big events happening. Migration, the migration story, and we have covered it many Fridays on this show about uh, those uh, illegal immigrants coming from France into Britain. Obviously, the weather's very bad at the moment uh, in the Channel. There hasn't been as many coming across this week, but that has the propensity to come back. We have the issues on the Ukrainian border with the Russians uh, amassing there, and we've covered that quite a lot today on GB News. Of course, we also have COVID. And dare I mention the Northern Ireland Protocol, which is a particular favourite of mine, as you can imagine. So there are quite a few things that could happen that could take things in a different direction. Am I right about that? Uh, you're right. The, uh, the Northern Ireland Protocol is, of course, very important yeah. to some people uh, within, uh, within the United Kingdom. Some very important but, people. <laughs> some important people, but a relatively, yes, I might I say, relatively that. small number. Uh, migration and, uh, and other issues really are all playing second fiddle to COVID and have yeah. done now for the last really two years. Uh, and so that is something that is really dominating the agenda. And what we've seen consistently throughout the pandemic is that support for the government generally and for Boris Johnson specifically yeah. has correlated very closely with whether people perceive the government is doing a good or a bad job in dealing with the pandemic. Yeah. Now, that was something that was a link that had if not broken, then certainly diminished over the last few weeks. Yeah. But with the rise of Omicron yeah. and focus once again returning to questions around lockdowns and rules, inevitably then the public focus returns to that and that's where we are. The question is, in the new year, uh, we'll have to see exactly what the impact of, the, uh, of this new variant has and whether that means we can move back to something resembling normal circumstances where we start to think as a nation about other things or whether that remains the focus for the foreseeable future. And of course, I haven't even mentioned the economy and how we're doing in terms of creating jobs and growth, which is normally the thing that we're talking about in terms of a government doing well. Is that something that might give him good news in the new year, or is it something that he should be concerned about as well? Uh, well, a bit of both, really. Boris yeah. Johnson, in our poll on the last weekend, uh, Delta Poll's poll showed that uh, Boris Johnson and the Conservatives were still seen as the better of the yeah. two main parties on the economy, which is, of course, traditionally such an important metric. Yeah. But we have issues around the cost of living, energy yeah. prices and so on and so forth, which could uh, cause implications, along, of course, with taxation and, uh, and public spending and all the questions around that. So there's a lot of difficult times ahead for the Conservatives. And the last thing they would want going into Christmas is firstly the threat of another lockdown yeah. for Christmas, which they would want to avoid. And secondly, all this other stuff, if you like, unrelated to policy, but instead calling into question the very character of Boris Johnson as Prime Minister. And only a few weeks ago, we were spending a lot of time talking about climate change and how we were going to combat climate change and all of that. And that all seems to have gone off the agenda because of everything else that's going on. Do you think that that is something that will come back again in terms of the Conservative Party? Because you mentioned the cost of living and, of course, climate change is linked to that and energy supplies. So will that come again in the new year? I expect it to. It's definitely a, a second tier issue yeah. at the moment behind, uh, uh, behind COVID and uh, COVID and short term health implications. So as those diminish, I imagine it will, uh, will rise back up the agenda. But, uh, but when that happens remains to be seen because we don't know how things will, uh, will develop with, uh, with the new variant or variants to come after that. Yeah. And indeed, um, we don't know what's going to happen on that Ukrainian border either, because if, if there is an incursion, as some people fear that there's going to be by Russia, I would imagine that that'll become a huge story at that point as well. Absolutely. But how that impacts on voting intention mm. will be interesting because generally speaking, public policy decisions when it comes to foreign policy don't have a massive impact. But this could be a massive story, so yeah. we'll have to wait and see. Well, Joe, we've covered a lot of ground there, and uh, I think we'll be talking about this for a, a lot longer as well. So thank you so much uh, for coming in uh, and having that conversation with me today. After the break, uh, we'll be crossing live to Vienna as Austria is lifting lockdown restrictions on Sunday, but not for the unvaccinated. Before that, let's take a look at the weather. It's time to remind ourselves, 
there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. Cold out there at the moment. It will be turning milder through the weekends, and it's also potentially going to get very windy in the northwest on Sunday night. Most of us will see some rain tomorrow. That's going to come from this weather system slowly edging in from the Atlantic. Weather front out in the North Sea, that has cleared away and it's left us, well, most of us with some sunshine during Friday, but showers have been coming in and they'll keep going this evening into Wales and northwest England. Elsewhere, most places dry with clear skies and as the winds ease down, we will see a frost in quite a few locations through this evening. By morning time, though, temperatures in the west will be rising because that weather front we saw earlier will be pushing in. But certainly yeah, a cold and frosty start across parts of northeast England and eastern Scotland. Some sunshine here, though, to start the day. But further west, grey and damp. A, a dismal morning for Northern Ireland. That rain spreading into Scotland. Bit of snow on the tops of the hills. And then that rain pushes into northern England, Wales and southwest England during the course of the day. It doesn't quite reach East Anglia and the southeast until after dusk. So most of the day dry here. But it will be cold in eastern areas, five or six at best. Whereas for the west, we'll eventually see temperatures getting up into double digits as things turn milder. That milder but wetter weather spreads to all areas on Saturday evening. The rain could be heavy for a time across East Anglia and the southeast during Saturday night. Easing off along the south coast and clearer skies across Scotland and Northern Ireland lead to a largely dry start to Sunday here. There'll be patchy rain over Northern England and North Wales on Sunday and the rain likely to pep up across Northern Ireland for a time as the winds start to increase. Much of the south dry on Saturday, but behind me developing is an area of low pressure. Now this needs watching because it could really intensify on Sunday night, bringing strong winds to Northern Ireland, but more particularly to northern and western parts of Scotland. We are quite concerned at the strength of the wind. There are Met Office warnings in place for this storm system moving in on Sunday night. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Join me, Nana Aquir, on Fridays, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons here on GB News. Expect fiery debate and passionate discussion as my panel and I take on some of the top stories hitting the headlines. You can look up the statistics. No, you look it up. I hug everyone. Oh. Oh. We learn from it and try and yeah. move on. That's it. Oh. <laughs> Opinion is at the heart of the show. It's a place for open and frank conversation, but without the fear of cancellation. So join me here on GB News on Friday, Saturday and Sunday afternoons between 4 and 6 p.m. watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. Join us for Political Correction. We're here every Sunday to correct politics and put you, the people, back in charge. 
We talk about all areas of the United Kingdom, including Northern Ireland. Our debate goes way beyond the Westminster Village. It's about the real country. It's about your opinion. So please, we want you to tell us what you think. This is The Political Correction. Every Sunday morning from 10 a.m. here on GB News. You're watching GB News Live across the UK, the world and our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We're here for you. Don't forget to join our community by hitting the subscribe button. And download the GB News app so you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you. Email us at gbviews at gbnews.uk. Thanks for being part of the GB News family. Welcome back. You're watching The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster. Austria will lift general lockdown restrictions on Sunday. However, the Chancellor, Karl Niehammer, has confirmed that this will not apply to the unvaccinated. The country went into lockdown two weeks ago to counter a surge in daily COVID-19 infections, which had risen to record levels. Restaurants, bars, theatres and non-essential shops are closed, except for takeaway. And hotels are also closed to tourists. Austria has one of the lowest vaccination rates in Western Europe, with just under 68% of the population being fully protected against COVID-19. Let's cross live now to Vienna to find out more with friend of the channel and head of news at ProSieben, Karina Milburn. Uh, Karina, hi, it's good to see you. Perhaps you could bring us up to date with what's happening uh, in Austria at the minute. Yes, so we're going out of lockdown on Sunday. That means the shops will open again. And then a week after that, um, also restaurants and hotels would open again. Um, several provinces made different measures, especially the ones dealing with a lot of tourism, are uh, opening restaurants sooner than others. But um, in one week, everything should be open, but only for the vaccinated. So there will be uh, controls about whether you are fully vaccinated or have recovered recently in the past six months from COVID, then you can go out and you can go in where you want to. Um, if you're not vaccinated, then you actually have to stay home and can only leave your home if you want to go to work or to go buy essential goods or to help someone. So that means lockdown is going on for the unvaccinated. And that's even before we will have mandatory vaccines from February on. And obviously, uh, those people who are unvaccinated uh, are feeling very sore about this. Um, how is this going to be implemented? I mean, how, how uh, is the government going to uh, look to see if people are vaccinated or unvaccinated? Are they bringing in passports, COVID passports, or what way are they implementing that? Yes, you need to have your vaccination certificate with you at all times. Many have it on their mobiles, so that's a QR code that you have in the green pass and you can show that. Or you can also have it on a piece of paper or in your vaccination uh, passport. So that's up to you. That also means that there's quite a lot of forged vaccination certificate, uh, certificates out there. But police are controlling quite a bit and there's quite heavy fines if you certificate the vaccination certificate. So, um, so that's the plan. Um, what, what unvaccinated people can do, because you always can do that, is go to demonstrations, because the right to, demonst to demonstrate is higher than any other. So that means that the demonstrations against vaccinations, and especially, especially against the mandatory vaccines, are getting traction and there's another big one coming up tomorrow. Yeah, well, that's very interesting that they're allowed to go out to uh, protest, but not actually uh, to yeah. do non-essential uh, shopping. Um, I mean, would you say, Karina, that actually the locking down of the unvaccinated will uh, have an impact or do you think it'll actually make some people even more determined not to be vaccinated? So um, when this was first introduced, that's already three weeks ago, it did have an impact. So vaccination rates went up. And when the general lockdown came, they went down again. So the rates slowed. So it might have an impact because people might be just sick of staying home or fearing controls. But you have this part of the population 
that simply so far pushed it until later. So they might do the vaccines now because of the lockdown for unvaccinated. But you also have a part that's scared, that have different medical concerns or are simply scared of the vaccine. So I don't know if these people are really going to be motivated by this. And then you have quite a big group, especially right-wing groups that are opposing vaccines as a means to opposing the system, how they call it. So as, as a means to opposing government and media and everything. And so these people are being fueled by these measures because now everything that they warned about, like mandatory vaccines, like um, unvaccinated people not being able to leave their homes, um, are coming through. So this is quite a fuel for the big protest movement that's building up in Austria. Yeah, I, yeah absolutely. And I mean, has the lockdown, the general lockdown worked? Are you seeing any fall in the numbers of people going into hospital or going into intensive care? Uh, has it had an impact, really? It had a big effect on new infections. We were up to 12,000 a day. That's a bit like if in Great Britain you would have 140 a day. So that's something, that, that's a level that in the UK never was reached. It was really high, so that more than half. So it had a big impact on that. But as you know, people going into hospital, going to hospital about two or three weeks after the infection, especially going into ICUs. So the number in the, the numbers in the ICUs are still really really high, much too high, so there's still operation being pushed, still cancer patients not getting treatment, and even quite a lot of children waiting for a heart operation that can't get their, their surgery right now because ICUs are full of people, especially unvaccinated people. So this is going to ease in the next weeks, hopefully, but for now, situation in hospital is still, is still really, really overstretched. Well, Karina, thank you so much for that update. It is interesting to hear about the ICUs and the hospitals. Obviously, you'll be hoping that those numbers do uh, become less uh, over the coming uh, weeks. And it's interesting, my colleague Darren McCaffrey was uh, tweeting today that uh, the fines in Austria are going to be £3,000 uh, per quarter um, so to everyone over the age of 14. So not just adults over 18, uh, but anyone over the age of 14 who refuses the vaccine from next month will be subject to a fine of £3,000 per quarter. Quite a lot of money uh, if you're a 15-year-old, uh, I have to say. But anyway, thank you, Quite Karina. Quite a lot of money, for... but that's still the draft. So it's, yeah. this is still going into discussion, so that's not, not the final law yet. There's yeah. quite a lot of open questions still. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for clarifying that, because uh, I thought, my goodness, that's quite a, an amount of money uh, to be finding people. So thank you, Karina, and thank you for coming on the show. Still to come, we'll be looking at what the First Ministers of Scotland and Wales have announced today in terms of COVID measures. But first, here's the news with Olivia Guthrie. Thank you. Good afternoon. Here are the latest headlines. Sir Keir Starmer says the Prime Minister is not fit for office and trust is at an all-time low. He made the comments while meeting residents in Hadston in Northumberland. It follows an investigation into three alleged Christmas parties during lockdown last December. Downing Street has announced it's cancelled this year's event. An increasing number of MPs say they'll vote against new COVID rules in England next week. That's as Plan B is enforced in a bid to slow the spread of the Omicron variant. Masks should now be worn in most indoor settings. In the last half hour, the independent body responsible for handling complaints against police forces says it's considering reopening the investigation into the Met's handling of the deaths of Stephen Port's victims. It follows an inquest which found officers in East London probably missed opportunities to catch serial killer Port, who's serving a whole life sentence for murdering four young gay men. Household contacts of positive COVID cases in Scotland will have to self-isolate for 10 days, regardless of whether they test negative for the virus. The First Minister, Nicola Sturgeon, warned the country could see a tsunami of infections because of the Omicron variant. In Wales, First Minister Mark Drakeford is urging people to take lateral flow tests every time they leave the house. He's also extended the guidance on face coverings to pubs and restaurants, as well as most indoor settings. 
and WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange is a step closer to being extradited following a win by the US government at the High Court. He's wanted on allegations of a conspiracy to obtain and disclose national defence information. He plans to appeal the latest ruling. We'll have a full update for you at the top of the hour. You're watching GB News live across the UK and the world on our digital stream. GB News is Britain's news channel. We are the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. We are here for you. Don't forget to join our YouTube community by clicking on that subscribe button. And if you want the GB News app, you can click and catch up on programmes anytime. We love to hear from you, so email us. GBviews at gbnews.uk Thanks for being part of the GB News family. My name is Andrew Doyle. Join me every Sunday evening at 7 p.m. for Free Speech Nation. This is a show where we address current affairs and news stories of the week with the help of two wonderful comedian panelists. I brought in comics because I want to give it a lighter edge and also they work for less. See you there. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate. And I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilised conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. I'm Colin Brazier. I've reported from more than 70 countries around the world, covered wars from Afghanistan to Iraq, from Lebanon to the Balkans. I'm trying to bring that experience, that feel for events, to the studio. And something else, I'm ready to give an opinion. Today's stories with a spark. Brazier from 8 p.m. weekdays on GB News. So welcome back. This is The Briefing with me, Arlene Foster, this Friday. So let's turn our attention to Scotland. First Minister Nicola Sturgeon has given a coronavirus briefing this afternoon, where she's confirmed that from tomorrow, household contacts of a positive COVID case will have to self-isolate regardless of their vaccination status. The First Minister also said that people should be considering vastly limiting their social contacts and added that the nature of the spread of Omicron meant that further heavy restrictions were likely. Sturgeon also pleaded with the Scottish public to cancel any form of Christmas party they have planned. Let's take a look at what she said. Uh, throughout this pandemic, and particularly at key stages of it, I've tried, uh, we have tried very hard to be open and upfront with you about the challenges and the uncertainties confronting us so that you can better understand if not always agree with, I accept the difficult judgments and decisions that we have had to make. I'm afraid this is another moment when such frankness is really important. Uh, the purpose of today's update is to level with you on what we know so far about the spread in Scotland of the new Omicron variant and also to share our estimate at this stage of what we're likely to face in the days and weeks to come. Uh, the fact is that we do face a renewed and a very severe challenge in the face of the new Omicron variant. Uh, to be blunt, because of the much greater and faster transmissibility of this new variant, we may be facing Indeed, we may be starting to experience a potential tsunami of infections. But the R number associated with Omicron is likely, we think, to be well over two and possibly closer to three. And as and when Omicron becomes the dominant strain, as it is in the process of doing, the R number associated with it will then increasingly become the R number for Scotland as a whole. So as a result, our estimate is that the R number overall in Scotland is likely to rise and possibly to rise above two. Uh, given that Omicron is now becoming dominant 
our response to it has to become more general because it will quickly be the case that most people who have COVID have the Omicron variant. And we must do all we can in that context to break the transmission chains. Therefore, from tomorrow, our advice will be that all household contacts of any confirmed COVID case should isolate for 10 days, regardless of their vaccination status, and even if they initially get a negative PCR test. So there we have the First Minister of Scotland updating us earlier on. And joining me now is Stephen Montgomery from the Scottish Hospitality Group. Stephen, you're very welcome to the programme. We heard the First Minister there saying that she's always tried to be open and upfront uh, with everybody. Is that how your sector thinks of uh, her Thank announcements? You. Good afternoon, Arlene. It's actually nice to be on the show today with a fellow Fermanagh woman, so uh, it's nice to be on. Um, I, I think hospitality in Scotland have been used to uh, last-minute decisions, and I think uh, last night was a real blow to us because uh, it came out from uh, Public Health Scotland and not direct from government, uh, which was pretty unusual, and from that we have just seen a tsunami of um, cancellations coming in, and where one of our members is today is reporting if it cancels for the next two weeks, they're set to lose in around 1.3 million. So that's a devastating effect. The, uh, the finance, the extra help that you got from Westminster uh, last year is not there. Uh, so how, how are those businesses going to survive, Stephen? Well, you're right. Uh, we were grateful of all the, the, the money we did get. Uh, it maybe wasn't enough to keep us all getting through it, but it certainly was helpful. And now we're sitting in a situation where if you even take this weekend where, you know, parties have been cancelled, uh, people's gatherings have been cancelled, you know, they're making that decision. All the fresh produce that we have is, is just going to have to go in the bin. Um, and we get no financial support for that. Now, it's not all about financial support for the businesses. Um, it's about financial support also for the staff who have already been through this with us as well. They need the support. Security. And now it's not down to me um, as one of the trade body, uh, bodies on the, on the, on the, on the system. Uh, it's down to the First Minister and everybody else to get that money. Now, whether that's from UK government or from their own government purse, it's got to come and go down to the businesses that need it right now. And has there been, I mean, you, you said last night the news came through from Public Health Scotland, which I myself thought was rather strange because the First Minister usually likes to make these announcements herself. Um, has there been any discussion with the government about financial assistance, financial help for the sector? Because, as you rightly say, it's always the hospitality sector that seems to be hit uh, when we have these rise, uh, rises in uh, COVID cases and now we've got this Omicron uh, variant. Has there been any discussion with you about what can, can be given? Not a thing. We were told the other day that uh, by Kate Forbes that, would, that there is no money in the Scottish in the Scottish bank account. Now, uh, Scottish Hospitality Group and myself, we actually asked for at the end of August this year for uh, a plan to be put in place, a winter contingency plan, just in case we did come across another variant. And here we are, stuck by the 10th of December, two weeks before Christmas. Uh, parties being cancelled uh, come from Public Health Scotland before the First Minister announced it. No support. People wondering about their jobs, and if they talk about mental health, what about that? You know, there's the the health and the mental health of customers, and um, the mental health of uh, our staff, our businesses. This is a really raw, emotional time, uh, not just for the businesses and the staff, but for the customers as well. Because last year we had, if you remember, what we called the Cinderella Christmas, where everybody had to be home, tucked up in their bed by Christmas night. And everybody was looking forward to a really good Christmas uh, this year. And hospitality needed it as well because, you know, we've all been through this. And I'm not saying we were worse off than any other sector, but we're certainly harder hit. Um, and, you know, they haven't had that. Now they've been advised. But one thing I would say is hospitality still remains open in Scotland. And if you do choose to come back and you know, to stay out, um, as we would ask people to, we will make it the safest place that you will be because we have all the ventilation, we have all the track and trace systems, all that kind of stuff in place. House parties don't have it. And if you want to protect your parents, your granny and all the rest of it, come and have it in a safe place of hospitality. Well, this is the, the, the issue I think that people miss, actually, that when you force people out of hospitality venues that are ventilated, that are putting in place social distancing rules, you're actually pushing people into house parties. That's the point that I have made uh, on yeah. many occasions, Stephen, and I agree with you on that. But to take uh, the First Minister's point, this is a doubling every two days. She's talking about a tsunami of cases that are coming uh, towards Scotland. Um, what else could she do, people will say? I mean... 
I want to ask you the final question, Stephen, and it's this. Um, what is the mood in the hospitality industry? It must be pretty low at this point in time. They were looking forward to Christmas, looking forward to Christmas time, taking them forward into January, into February. It must be terrible at the minute. Uh, totally, Arlene. It's um, probably the lowest today that it's ever, ever been. And we all talk about Black Friday the week before Christmas. You know, everybody goes out and about and enjoys themselves. Yeah, yeah. Today is Big Friday. That's exactly what it is. The mood within the hospitality sector just now is probably the lowest it's ever been. We were starting to get the, the uh, customer confidence back. And that was a major, major part of our, our, our job. And um, people were starting to come back in the hospitality because they were used to what we were doing. We were get, They were getting used to us being a safe place. And last night, as I say, just absolutely devastated this, this hospitality sector. Well, Stephen, thank you for joining us uh, today. And for Mama is still doing well, I'm sure you'll be glad to hear. And uh, I'll talk to you Anytime. soon. Thanks, Stephen. Thank you. So Wales, we're off to Wales now. And the First Minister, Mark Drakeford, held the three-week review of coronavirus and Wales restrictions uh, this afternoon. Although Mr Drakeford has outlined that there are no significant changes made to the guidance currently in place, he did not rule out further restrictions uh, in the future. And our Wales uh, reporter, Lily Hewitson, uh, attended the press conference and has been keeping across the story for us today. Lily, what's been announced today? Yes, good afternoon. There are no significant changes uh, to the restrictions here in Wales um, as of the press conference this afternoon. People in Wales, though, have been asked to flow before they go. So taking that lateral flow test before heading out to meet uh, a, a vast number of people, whether that be at a Christmas party um, or perhaps going shopping. Uh, they're also being asked to make sure they take that invitation of the booster vaccine. Now, every single adult in Wales should have received that invitation by the end of January according to the Welsh Government. There's also changes to uh, face mask wearing. So that's now been extended into pubs and restaurants. So you'll be asked to wear a face mask if you're in a pub or restaurant when you're not eating or drinking going forward, although they are still mandatory in many other settings. Wales is said to be about two weeks behind the numbers of Omicron cases that we're seeing in Scotland and um, in England at the moment. And in order to deal with that, the Welsh Government have changed the review system slightly. So we usually have that three-week review every three weeks, but now they're going to be changing it to a weekly review. So on every Friday, the First Minister will take a press conference uh, to review the situation, the public health situation here in Wales. Now, I had a chat to Mark Drake with this afternoon at the press conference, and I asked him in particular how, if the parties um, that reportedly took place in Number 10 might have impacted people's willingness to uh, take on board any of the new restrictions? I think the reports of parties at number 10 will make people in Wales less likely to follow any new guidance. Uh, well, I think there's one very important difference that we have here in Wales, and the same will be true of Scotland and Northern Ireland, which is that we have a government of our own uh, here in Wales. And the messages that we have given to people in Wales have, throughout the pandemic, been very different to the ones that the Prime Minister has conveyed across the border. I have never come here and said to people in Wales, it'll all be over in 12 weeks, it'll all be over by Easter, it'll all be over by Christmas, that Freedom Day was an irreversible set of decisions. Uh, those are the things that I think tend to erode people's confidence in what government says if government is always saying things that is at the impossibly optimistic uh, end of the spectrum. Here in Wales, we have tried as a government to go on explaining to people that coronavirus is not over, that we've got to go on doing the things we do, that if we act cautiously and carefully, that is the best way of keeping each other safe. And I hope the fact that people in Wales have had that consistent messages here in Wales mean that we will go on, as we have been very lucky to have up until now, the support of the vast bulk of people in Wales who go on every day thinking and acting carefully and playing their part. So that's the First Minister there. Um, what has the opposition had to say about today's announcement, Lily? 
Yeah, I had a chat to Andrew R.T. Davis, the leader of the Welsh Conservatives, uh, this afternoon, straight after that pro press conference. And he was actually fairly uh, complimentary of what Mark Drakeford suggested today um, and the, the change from the three-week review uh, to that one-week review going forward. A sensible approach because obviously the science is filling in the gaps of our knowledge as we speak if you like every day there's a new piece of information coming out from some part of the world such as South Africa which is obviously grappling with the cases of the Omnicom virus uh, we thankfully have higher rates of vaccination and so what's really important is that people respond to the public health messages play their part so that we don't end up with more draconian restrictions we can't afford to keep shutting the economy down we can't afford the damage on our health service of the massive waiting times every time operations are suspended and obviously the mental health impact on people if if there was to be a lockdown and you indicated you know perhaps next friday might be the time that they bring in some restrictions. What do you expect that could look like? Well, I think what's important at the moment is that we reflect on the evidence as it comes forward. And that evidence is literally coming forward on a day by day basis as to what is required to obviously suppress the virus in the community. Uh, I very much hope that there'll be no extension of COVID passports uh, because ultimately no one to date has provided evidence that they ultimately that they actually achieve what some supporters of COVID passports say they would achieve, which is stopping the virus spreading. I've asked for that evidence to be made available and I haven't seen that. And we've got to be careful that we don't infringe on people's civil liberties uh, because ultimately what we're succeeding in doing via the vaccination program and the booster program is holding the virus in check in many parts of our communities. And we've got to make sure that we get good, strong, clear public messaging out there so people know what is expected of them. And so, Lily, just before I let you go, uh, we've had some reports that the, the First Minister of Wales had indicated uh, that he was in favour of a Christmas lockdown during a devolved meeting uh, with the other ministers from Northern Ireland uh, and Scotland and uh, UK government. Has there been any response from uh, the Welsh government about that? Yeah, very interesting indeed. Mark Drakeford didn't give anything away when he was asked about this at the press conference this afternoon. We're not entirely sure who did leak that information um, and if it is true or not. When I did have a chat to Welsh Government, they did say that they don't comment on any private discussions, but they did say that there are no significant changes uh, to, the re to the restrictions here in Wales expected in the meantime. OK, Lily, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. So moving then to Northern Ireland, no, it hasn't uh, gone away. And thankfully for a change, we're not talking about COVID, but actually the ongoing interminable negotiations on the Northern Ireland Protocol, which are still taking place every week. Uh, last week, last week uh, Strathclyde University published a, a paper which debunked the notion that the protocol offered the best of both worlds. That's the idea that's been put forward uh, by many supporters of uh, the protocol since the Brexit negotiations concluded. However, the paper describes that claim uh, as mere fiction. Uh, and I'm delighted now to be joined uh, by Professor Graham Gudgeon. Uh, he's an honorary research associate from the Centre for Business Research at Cambridge Judge Business School. Uh, Graham, really good to have you on the programme. Um, and of course, we have known for some time that it isn't the best of both worlds, but perhaps you could explain uh, why it's not the best of both worlds. Hello, Arlene. Uh, very nice to be on your, uh, on your programme today. Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's fairly obvious when, when you think about it that um, Northern Ireland exports about 10, 11% of its GDP to, to the Republic uh, and to the rest of the EU, but it imports about 30% of, of what it needs from GB. Now, there are some advantages in exporting to the EU from the protocol. But there are big, big downsides and disadvantages on importing because all imports now have to fill in uh, customs declarations. Many of them are checked, particularly food and uh, animals and so on, uh, undergo a lot of checks. Um, and uh, this adds quite a lot of costs to imports. So the, the downside is much bigger than the, uh, the, than, than the upside. And of course, I, I think some uh, opponents of Brexit and supporters of the protocol have been just emphasizing one side of the equation. 
And uh, of, of, of course, that's not a, a reasonable thing to do. And of course, we've seen some GB companies, quite understandably, I have to say, saying that it's not worth their while continuing to do business with Northern Ireland because there's so much work involved and they would have to employ staff to fill in the forms. That's something that doesn't really get talked a lot about, but that's, that's absolutely the case, isn't it? Yes, um, I mean, the evidence is hun hundreds of firms in GB, probably mainly smallish firms, uh, have said e exactly what you just suggested, which is that it's, it's not really worthwhile. If you have to fill in lots of, uh, uh, lots of forms, if there are costs, uh, if everything takes longer to, to get into Northern Ireland, uh, you say, well, actually, look, there's no profit in this. We, 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 we just won't do it. Um, and of course, what yeah, then happens, of course, yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say, what, what, what then happens, of course, is that firms in, in Northern Ireland are forced to try and go elsewhere to get the supplies, you know, what, whether it be food, toys, electronic components or, or, or whatever. Um, and they, they, they may be more expensive, pushing up costs for consumers in, in, uh, in Northern Ireland. And, that and that's, that, 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 that's the point I was going to actually make, Graham. actually, the mm. trade diversion point which was put into the protocol that if that happened, then we could trigger Article 16 to try and deal with that. And there very clearly is trade diversion. People are looking for different uh, supply chains. And as you say, mostly uh, they're more expensive. So therefore, the cost has to be passed on to the consumer. Uh, and actually, the amount of produce that we have to choose from will also shrink because there are some things that you won't be able to get elsewhere. That's right. So, uh, I mean. Some things are currently banned by, under EU uh, rules. Uh, for instance, chilled, chilled meats. Um, EU rules say that all this has to be frozen and not uh, and not chilled sausages. That um, uh, that sort of thing. It may be that they relax the rules. Uh, we, we'll see out of these negotiations. But at present, the rules are that those things just can't go into Northern Ireland at all. Of and, course, this uh, is ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, you and I look at this and, and think there's bound to be a solution. And do you think the solution was put forward in the command paper, which came out in July by the government? Yes, I, 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 I think it does. I, I think that deals with what we say over, over ninety percent of the of the problems. Um, the most important part of the command paper is, is that it says that any goods going into Northern Ireland which aren't destined uh, for the Republic or the EU shouldn't have any checks or um, paperwork, customs declarations at all. And that, that will restore Northern Ireland's uh, place in the UK single market. Um, the current situation is, I, I don't know just how much um, many people in GB re re realise that there is now a a firm customs border between yeah. two parts of the, the EU. Of course, they, they, they would regard that as completely um, unsustainable if the border was between, say, Yorkshire and um, Lincolnshire or, or whatever. Um, but it's between Great Britain and, uh, and Northern Ireland. But if, if we could get everything in the command paper, most of that would be undone uh, and restored. But it does look as if the EU negotiators are resisting most of yeah. that. They will do some of it. They realise that they're on pretty shaky ground when it comes to medicines. Uh, you know that, that medicines should be checked going from in, into the uh, National Health Service in in Northern Ireland, for instance. You know that that's. That's particularly yeah. ridiculous. But I, I, I mean, you're no right way. about that, Graham. Uh, the medicines, I think it will be moved on, but that's such a small part, a very important part, but a very small part uh, of the uh, protocol. Graham, thank you for joining me uh, on the briefing. I hope we'll be able to bring you on uh, and have a, a further conversation in the near future. But uh, we've run out of time, as usual. Uh, it always goes very quickly, but you've been watching the briefing with me, Arlene Foster. The show is back every weekday from 12 p.m. And I'll be back next Friday at 3 p.m. Up next, it's Nana, but for now, I'll leave you with your weather forecast. It's time to remind ourselves, there's always another winter. Canary Islands sponsors the weather. Hello again. Cold out there at the moment. It will be turning milder through the weekends, and it's also potentially going to get very windy in the northwest on Sunday night. 
Most of us will see some rain tomorrow. That's going to come from this weather system slowly edging in from the Atlantic. Weather front out in the North Sea, that has cleared away and it's left us, well, most of us with some sunshine during Friday, but showers have been coming in and they'll keep going this evening into Wales and northwest England. Elsewhere, most places dry with clear skies and as the winds ease down, we will see a frost in quite a few locations through this evening. By morning time, though, temperatures in the west will be rising because that weather front we saw earlier will be pushing in. But certainly yeah, a cold and frosty start across parts of northeast England and eastern Scotland. Some sunshine here, though, to start the day. But further west, grey and damp. A, a dismal morning for Northern Ireland. That rain spreading into Scotland. A bit of snow on the tops of the hills. And then that rain pushes into Northern England, Wales and southwest England during the course of the day. It doesn't quite reach East Anglia and the southeast until after dusk. So most of the day dry here. But it will be cold in eastern areas, five or six at best. Whereas for the west, we'll eventually see temperatures getting up into double digits as things turn milder. That milder but wetter weather spreads to all areas on Saturday evening. The rain could be heavy for a time across East Anglia and the southeast during Saturday night. Easing off along the south coast and